All right, I think we're going to get started. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Brittany Garrett, and I am the Collections and Research Public Programming Specialist here at Old Surbridge Village. And tonight, I have the great pleasure of welcoming you to our Collections and Research Department webinar, Redefining American Patriotism, Identity, and Military Service in 19th Century Massachusetts. So tonight, we will be discussing two military units, the Montgomery Guards, which were the first Irish-American military company formed in Boston in 1837, and the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment, the first African-American unit raised in the North to fight in the American Civil War and the trials and impacts that they had on society in Massachusetts. Today, we have um, a few guest speakers joining us. To share his knowledge on the Montgomery Guard, we have Dr. Matthew Cagle from, uh, from Fort Ticonderoga. Dr. Cagle has been involved in curation, exhibitions, research, historical interpretation, and program development for historic sites and museums in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, Delaware, Virginia, and North and South Carolina. He holds a bachelor's degree from Cornell University, a master's in American material culture from the Winter Tour Museum, and a PhD from the Bard Graduate Center in New York City. He joined Fort Ticonderoga in 2014 and has been involved in developing exhibits, conducting research, delivering programs, and advancing our understanding of the 18th century military experience. He has researched and lectured at archives and collections across the United States, Canada, and Europe, with a particular research focus on military dress in the late 18th century. Welcome, Matt, and thank you for joining us tonight. Unfortunately, it would seem that um, the Murchie Fraser cannot join us tonight, but we will have a brief discussion on the 54th Massachusetts Regiment afterwards. And lastly, we have the Derek Heidemann, the Director of Collections and Research here at Old Sturbridge Village, who will be mediating the entire discussion. Before we get started, I have a few technical things to share. This program is being recorded and will be posted on the Old Sturbridge Village YouTube page, which I encourage you all to visit. There will also be a question and answer session following our discussion tonight. So I invite our live viewers to submit questions at any point during the presentation in the Q&A feature at the bottom center of your screen. And now without any further ado, I will pass things over to Derek to begin our discussion. Thank you so, Britain, so much, Brittany. And thank you for everyone for being here tonight. Uh, I hope we have some people joining from some of our museums we're partnered with here. We're very excited to be collaborating with Fort Ticonderoga um, and with the Museum of African American History in Boston. So um, I'd like to thank Matthew for being here for the program and lending your expertise as well. Um, so as members of OSV will already know, last year we opened a new exhibit for a 75th anniversary called New England on Parade. That exhibit is inspired by research in a recent publication by Jay Nyland Lander, the best ever, uh, which delves into the history of parades in New England. Our exhibit does the same and, and basically covers a period from, seven, 18, sorry, from 1776 to 1940. Uh, and it's spread out in three different locations throughout the museum to talk about all different types of, of topics or about parades in the time period. Uh, that exhibit, which has some new and exciting objects that will actually be rotating onto public view this summer, uh, is open until July of 2023. So parades have a vibrant and complex past in New England. Uh, for some, they were events that were exciting and filled with cheer, but for others, they were exclusionary. It's very important to recognize that. Uh, military service and parades were inextricably linked in the 19th century in Massachusetts and elsewhere. Uh, and military units of various kinds typically enjoyed prominent positions within the structure of parades or citizen processions in the time period as well. Um, the question is, you know, who is the people? Who are the people that actually made up these military organizations in the time period that, that enjoy these prominent positions within parades? So in Massachusetts, the militia laws only allowed white men to serve in the militia, um, and then there were also some Anglo-American Yankees who had their own opinions about who actually had the right to be serving in the militia as well and bearing arms for their state and for the country in many ways. So that's really the point that we want to be getting at today is thinking about identity, how it's infused with military service and patriotism, um, and looking at a couple of these different situations. So like Brittany had mentioned, we'll be talking a little bit about the Montgomery Guards in Boston in the 1830s, and also about the 54th Massachusetts Infantry during the American Civil War. And the hope is to gain a little bit more of an understanding of how these two military units attempted to, again, infuse their own identities with patriotism and patriotic service uh, to attempt to gain more acceptance, more agency within larger Massachusetts society in the 19th century. Um, and arguably, when you look at the history of these two units, the most poignant parts of their history could be considered starting with the parade. Um, so we're going to start by handing it over to Dr. Matthew Cagle, and he's going to talk a little bit tonight about the Montgomery Guards in Boston. So Matt, it's all yours. 
All right, thank you. And um, thanks to Old Surbridge Village for uh, having me back. As, uh, as Derek knows, I, I used to work there a long time ago and it's a, a, a very fond place for me. And so I'm really excited to be able to share this and, and the intersection of the history that uh, Old Surbridge Village deals with and uh, the collection here at Fort Ticonderoga. And you know what's interesting about this in some ways is that the, the objects that we have in the collection of the Fort Ticonderoga Museum, uh, which I'll share with you here uh, right now, I, I don't have a lot of slides, but I wanted to give you a nice uh, image of the Montgomery Guards uniform that we have in the collection. Um, this is kind of at the, at the very outer extreme of what we collect and preserve here at Fort Ticonderoga, which really focuses kind of on the long 18th century, which a lot of people would argue in 1815, um, pushing a, a decade and a half at least after that. Um, but I think it's important and I think it's it's unique because of, of what it represents. And you know, I should start in some ways by saying that for as long as a museum has had this, which has been at least half a century, I think at this point, um, it was actually misidentified. Um, it wasn't identified as a uniform of the Montgomery Guards in Boston, um, but attributed to a Manchester Guards of New Hampshire. Um, and this may be due to the buttons, it may be due to some sloppy record keeping. I don't know how you can look at this uniform and not see it as an Irish company, though. Um, you know, the, the identity of the wearers of this uniform is, is proclaimed uh, loud and proud uh, on this outfit. And so as I um, was searching around, um, myself to try to understand this uniform, uh, realized that within our collection at Fort Ticonderoga, this uh, coat was actually attributed also to the accompanying cap from the same individual. Um, we actually have two of the caps in our collection here at, at Ticonderoga, um, and the cap is a little more well known and it's identified there are other collections that have these, you know, proportionately for a militia company in the 1830s, there's a lot of caps that have survived from this one company, despite their relatively short life. Um, and in some of the paperwork documenting what we'll talk about in a minute about what happened to this company, um, I, I stumbled across a reference um, to a New York newspaper, which um, says, and I quote, suppose that the adoption of the national color the arrangement of some lace in the form of a sprig of shamrock and, and of the harp do mark the uniform of the Montgomery Guards. And that was kind of the nail in this to, to fully firmly attribute this uniform um, to the Montgomery Guards use in the 1830s. Um, and uh, I guess to get right into the story of the company, Derek and I know have probably a lot to talk about after this. Um, this is a company that is formed only at the beginning of 1837 um, by most accounts of naturalized Irish immigrants and even more first generation um, Americans, you know, whose parents were, were Irish, born in America though. Um, and they get a charter to form a military company as part of the volunteer militia that Massachusetts maintains just like almost every other state in the union um, where volunteers could, if they met the, the number and they got the charter from their state, um, they could form a military organization. They would have to uniform it, you know, equip it in many cases uh, on their own dime. Uh, and in doing so, uh, you know, the benefits were on one hand to show their patriotism, to show their support uh, of, the, of the country they were in. Um, and, you know, there's an element of, of status, social status in many of these units. Um, and so by creating this company and forming this company, you're raising the status of the individual members in a very visible way. Uh, as Derek member, these guys parade uh, at various events, holidays, celebrations, as well as their you know, legally obligated musters at various times of the year. Um, so it's a very visible way of asserting your identity, your citizenship, um, and, and your willingness to support that society. And what is so interesting about the Montgomery Guards is that they combine this identity as Americans, you know, this is the American militia with their identity as Irishmen. You know, the two are not incompatible. They can be both Irish and American in their eyes. And the uniform expresses that. I mean, the coat obviously, you know, with the shamrocks on it made in this uh, silk um, kind of tape uh, worked all over the breast, the green color, it, it screams Irish. But when you look at the cap, even more, I think the duality of this identity is, is even more evident. And this is a detail hopefully you can see of uh, the cap itself. What's amazing about the cap too is that, you know, not only is the detail there, but this would have had to be in a specifically made die just for this company. 
And, you know, they went to the level of getting an investment. They didn't get a stock, you know, Starburst hat plate. Sturbridge has a lot in their collection. We've got a lot in our collection as well. You know, they're, they're really common at this time period. They had their own plate made. And actually at the very corner, you can still make out the initials of, uh, I guess, who cut the die maybe, and the date, 1837. It's right there in the brass. Um, and it combines these elements right away. You see the Irish harp, as that description said, and there's the eagle surmounting the harp, laying over it in a field of shamrocks with the star burst behind it. It's this incredible combination of the iconography of the United States and of Ireland. And the, the ribbon there, which you, you maybe just can make out, kind of scrolling through the harp, says, fostered under thy wings, we will die in thy defense this powerful statement that these, these Irishmen have committed themselves to the service of the United States, which has given them uh, a home. Uh, and what's more, there's another layer to it that's expressed in the initials here in the name of the company, Montgomery Guards. The, the MG, of course, uh, stands for that. This isn't a, a British racing car. And Montgomery is a very explicit reference to Richard Montgomery. Uh, Richard Montgomery was actually an Irishman uh, he had served in the British Army during the French and Indian War. Uh, and then later, as the American Revolution breaks out, he sides with the Americans. He brings his knowledge of British military practice and his experience as a soldier to the American Army, uh, becomes a general in the Continental Service, and leads the actually relatively successful American invasion of Canada over the second half of 1775, launching from Fort Ticonderoga, where I work, driving to the north, um, fort after fort at Saint-Jean and Chambly and Montreal fall to Montgomery's forces. And he brings them to the gates of Quebec City, um, accomplishing in a matter of months what it took the British army, the entire French and Indian War to do. And uh, on New Year's Eve, for a variety of reasons, uh, an attack is launched on Quebec City to try to seize the town. Benedict Arnold leads one column against the lower part of the city. Montgomery leads the upper column against the upper fortifications of the city. And in among the first volleys of cannon fire from the fort, Montgomery is killed instantly. Uh, he becomes one of the greatest martyrs to the early Revolutionary War um, and the highest ranking American casualty uh, of the Revolutionary War. And what these Irishmen were doing in 1837 then was directly connecting themselves to a long-standing history of Irish in the service of the United States. We are here from the beginning uh, and we are continuing this legacy. And, and so it's with this uniform um, that they are formed in 1837, with this iconography that they are formed um, as part of the uh, volunteer companies, the, the, the light infantry, um, effectively, of the Boston Brigade of Militia. Um, and they do see some service. I'm sure Derek can, can talk more um, during the Broad Street riots in Boston. There's a lot of agitation going on in Boston in the 1830s um, between the, the native citizens and uh, immigrants. Um, but the story really kind of comes to its, its you know, denouement uh, in September of 1837 at the Brigade Muster, when, you know, by law, you have to muster all the companies of your brigade, you go through all the drills and exercise review, etc. Uh, and the brigade begins to form on, on Boston Common, the Montgomery Guards, the junior company marches out onto the line. And as they arrive, Ultimately, five of the other companies of the brigade, these are the uniform companies, not the, the beat militia. These are the uniformed volunteers, you know, the, the cream of Boston militia. Five companies end up, or most of five companies end up about facing and marching off the field, refusing to, to do duty with the Montgomery Guards in the common, by some accounts flying the American flag and playing Yankee Doodle uh, as they marched away. And this leaves, you know, the whole the whole atmosphere of this, you know, Derek was talking about parades, the whole parade kind of you know, festival atmosphere of the militia muster is just ruined now. Um, and, and it goes south from there. Uh, people start jeering and hissing at the Montgomery guards. And by the end of the day, you know, they've gone through their their legal obligation to, to do their review and they begin to march back. And as they march back uh, towards Faneuil Hall and their armory, they end up getting mobbed. Um, some accounts uh, I've read in the papers from the time suggest that you know, 3,000 people surround them and they're hurling insults and they're swearing and they're hissing at them and they're throwing things, you know, brick bats, uh, paving stones, clubs, glass, coal, um, hurling it at these men who are, who are receiving these insults with remarkable fortitude. Um, and this is something that comes out frequently in the accounts is the, the, the forbearance that they show, you know, these are armed soldiers, they, they could have opened fire, technically, um, and they didn't, 
They keep going. They march back to their um, to their armory. Uh, a bunch of their guys are wounded. These beautiful caps on at least one guy is stove in from bricks being hurled at them. They're bloody. They're bruised. Uh, and they get back there, and the mob, you know, surrounds uh, their armory, and it takes the mayor of Boston uh, and a group of dignitaries to kind of, you know, get the mob talked down and away um, and, and prevent them from storming the armory and, you know, maybe doing, doing more harm, if, if not, uh, you know, outright killing these guys. Um, and it becomes a, a big, you know, kind of national issue. And, and you can follow it in the press after this, you know, and a lot of the press is deeply negative towards the it, it bigoted Boston, uh, as it comes up in a lot of the headlines, um, that Boston, this great city has once again, uh, in the 1830s, shown their disdain for immigrants, for a company that is expressed in a lot of the press as, as doing their civic duty. You know, they are meeting their obligation by law as citizens to muster in the militia. And they've been uh, interrupted in this by the citizenry um, and rejected from this. And uh, ultimately, you know, in the wake of this, uh, the governor of Massachusetts, Edward Everett, uh, actually revokes the charter disbanding uh, the five companies that marched off the field, because by marching off the field, they failed to fulfill their legal obligation uh, under their charters and to the militia laws of the state. Um, now, for most of these companies, which are kind of the old Protestant Yankee companies, you know, it's not too long before they reform, get new charters, slightly different names to their companies, and they're back in the field. Um, and it seems for a while that that might be the issue. Uh, you know, it, it might be over. A handful of the perpetrators of the, the mob are, are uh, arrested and tried, but you know, from what I've seen, it ends up being maybe three or four individuals out of 3,000. You know, it's a drop in the bucket. Um, and, and ultimately, um, in early 1838, the Montgomery Guards have their charter revoked. Um, and Derek and I were talking a bit earlier that the exact terms of this are, are a little unclear and there's some dispute in the press at the time. Um, there is a claim uh, in many cases that it was because they had actually enlisted um, non-citizens, so immigrants who had not been naturalized as citizens of the United States. Um, although a lot of the press coverage of this goes you know, very explicitly to say that no, these were naturalized Irishmen or they were first generation Irish born in this country. Um, some papers go so far as to say they pay their taxes. These are taxpayers. They are freeholders. They are true citizens of the United States. Um, there's also another uh, um, aspect of this, which is the possibility that the governor disbands the company, revokes their charter, um, because their, their mere existence is a kind of a provocation, a threat to the citizenry. And so for the maintenance of public order, uh, their existence is denied. Uh, and I think, and um, this uniform right now, uh, I will add, is, is on display at Fort Ticonderoga. It's going to be up for uh, this year and next year. So if you come to our museum and, and go to our exhibit, um, a well-regulated militia, citizen, soldier, and state, you can see this. Um, and I think it's so powerful because it gets right at the heart of, you know, what military service was in the early 19th century, because military service for most people wasn't joining the US Army. It was serving in the militia in some capacity, but also what that could mean and how, especially in this voluntary capacity of uniformed militia companies, that could raise someone's status, especially from a marginalized community um, and bring them into American society. And they could show the world that they were functioning citizens of this young republic. Um, equal to anyone else. And the press coverage from the time actually uses this argument in some ways. They say, you know, how is this any different than the German Fusiliers of New York um, or of Scottish or French ethnic regiments that were formed? How is this different from Lafayette, de Kalb, Steuben, Montgomery himself, who served during the revolution from other countries and helped create this nation? Um, and even though there's sympathy for the Montgomery Guards, it's interesting that a number of the press coming out says, yeah, you know, we don't really like the idea of, of the Irish forming companies like this, but they have a right to do it as Americans um, once they've been naturalized or if they're born in this country, and we should defend that right. Um, and again, it shows that, you know, what citizenship was, what it entailed, what obligations were there to the state was contested terrain uh, in the early 19th century, even into the late 1830s. Uh, this isn't the first time something like this happened. Um, at least in the late 1790s, there's a company called the New York Hibernian Volunteers that was basically not allowed to receive commissions from the governor of New York, um, probably because he feared the Republican impulses of these Irishmen in the context of the late 1790s. 
So the ability for Irish, and as we'll see, other um, ethnicities and um, marginalized groups to express themselves through the militia as one organ of American society was hotly contested terrain uh, in the early 19th century. And I think there's some you know, powerful lessons for you know, not only that time period, but you know, ongoing in American history and how this country treats uh, immigrants who want to become part of the nation and get the benefits uh, of citizens in the United States. I'm going to cede the floor to my uh, my colleague here from Old Ridge Village, Derek. And uh, oh, thank you, Matt. No, no I think you, you you raised a lot of good points, and thank you so much for the history. It was excellent, um, and for showing those images, the amazing uniform that, that the fort has. You're very very fortunate to have that that whole uniform up there at the fort. But I think you know I, you talked about this a lot about this you know having the right to be able to serve. Um, it, there's a reason why forming a militia company like this was viewed as such an important thing, right? This is not just something that you and your buddies did because you thought it would be a cool way to organize, right? This is, a, it's not a social club purely. This is something that's, it's literally controlled by the state, which is outwardly in a lot of ways controlled by the federal government in, by actually implementing the 1792 Militia Act, which says each state needs to maintain their own militia. And you need to serve if you are a white, able-bodied man from 18 to 45. So automatically, they're, they're excluding people from the militia. Um, but it is something where they're trying to really make sure that that it, it's understood that serving the militia is something that really means that you're 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 contributing to your community, you're computer, you're contributing to the Republican ideals of what the United States was was trying to be in the end of the 18th century and early 19th century. So um, yeah, it's, it's such a such an interesting story. So, so Matt, if you were to think about, you know, going forward, what the what the impact was of the Montgomery Guards, both really in the time period, you talked a lot about the different accounts and some other types of, of ethnic militia companies that formed, uh, but even going beyond that, I mean, can you think of any other kinds of impacts today or, or even just later in the 19th century? That, uh, that the Montgomery Guards experience kind of sets up for us? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, you know, this, it, this won't be the last time that the ability of, of immigrants to participate in American society comes up. Um, you know, I fair, fair warning, I'm an historian of the early modern period. So after the 1830s, I get a little hazy. But, you know, again, we can see repeatedly in, in, in this country's history that, you know, the rights and the privileges and the obligations of citizenship have not always been evenly distributed amongst people based on you know where they come from and 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 their own experiences um it is interesting to me to see the response in the press of the 1830s to the kind of the injustice that they feel um you know obviously sentiment pro or con for the irish and for catholics varies regionally and nationally depending on where one is um, and most of the press coverage that I've been able to access for this incident, uh, you know, comes up in the, you know, eastern seaboard. You know, I don't know if news of this was making its way west or back to Ireland. You know, that would be fascinating to, yeah. to understand how the Irish, Irish were responding to this. And what's interesting, too, is that, you know, this is, you know, if, if this is one kind of, if we plot the role of, of immigrant communities like this, even just the Irish, you know, there are waves and troughs of their ability. They don't stop trying to participate um, in these institutions. Um, we've got another cap here at Fort Ticonderoga. I, I still haven't pegged down exactly where it's from. It's similar in that shape. You know, Derek, you're familiar with that, you know, kind of cylindrical, tall, conical cap with a big brass brim um, that has an MR that is attributed, at least in some of the notes we have, to potentially a Montgomery Rifles. So an yet another allusion to Montgomery, and those don't stop. They continue all the way into the Civil War. We find Irish companies being raised that reference Montgomery as this kind of paragon of the Irish martyr to uh, American independence. And, uh, you know, they may have been more successful. I certainly, you know, if you search for Montgomery Guards over a variety of different things, you will find different Montgomery Guards as well. There was a company in New Orleans that I think lasted longer than the Boston one. But, you know, New Orleans is also, you know, a really ethnically diverse, linguistically diverse uh, city, far more than Boston uh, in a lot of ways. And clearly, I think that that found some more uh, acceptance there. You know, this is a city that also at the early 19th century had a, an entire, you know, free men of color formed into a military organization, something you, you wouldn't have seen in a lot of the Eastern cities, certainly in the American South. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that although this, this gets a lot of attention at the time, it certainly doesn't 
you know, put a full stop to Irish and Irish Americans trying to claim American citizenship and all that comes with that. Absolutely. I mean, I just think, of course, of instances during the Civil War where there's so many famous regiments um, that were almost entirely composed of, of Irish Americans. Um, and that's just something that seems so much more common by that time period. But they really get their roots earlier on this time period. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I guess that's a pretty good segue. So we can talk a little bit about the 54th Massachusetts um, during the American Civil War. So um, I, I am going to I am not the expert that Liberty Fraser is on the 54th, but I'm going to try to do it the best justice that I can, talking about the history of the unit um, and really just trying to bring it, just like the Montgomery Guards, back to this whole exhibit and this whole topic of parades in New England um, that we currently have at the museum. So let me just bring up my PowerPoint real quick. Okay. Okay, so right here we have the very, very famous uh, portrait, or not portrait, monument uh, of the Robert Gould Shaw and 54th Massachusetts Monument in Boston, um, which is actually just rededicated, I think just a, a month or so ago in Boston. It's a beautiful, beautiful monument um, that pays homage to the, the service of the 54th Massachusetts during the American Civil War. Um, so for those who don't know, the 54th Massachusetts is really the first all black regiment apart from the officers, which are white, uh, which is raised in the North during the American Civil War, um, really right after the Emancipation Proclamation really takes effect in 1863. The idea being at that point, now the war has been shifted towards more of a goal about ending slavery as long as, as well as, as preserving the Union. Um, and so finally, Massachusetts with, with Governor Andrew, governor at the time, pushes to have an all black regiment to go south and fight. Um, and, and try to help win the war. Um, so in 1863, they then go south. Um, they end up going down to uh, South Carolina where they have arguably one of their most, uh, their most storied and most infamous battles down at Fort Wagner in South Carolina, just outside of Charleston Harbor, um, where they, they charge into a, a really horrific situation, trying to take a battery and take absolutely horrific casualties. Um, and unfortunately, that's really what it took for other Americans to see that African Americans serving on behalf of the United States, on behalf of, of the country, um, were really just as good as any other white soldier, anyone else that was actually fighting at the time. So this really was a big, big moment for the United States. And, and eventually what ends up happening is lots and lots of other regiments are raised of, uh, of you know, free black men that are serving in the United States Army. Almost up to 150, sorry, 180,000 um, free black men are serving in the Union Army during the Civil War. So so it's a really important part of the history um, as we're starting to see again. You know, we saw with the Montgomery Guards, Irish Americans were not necessarily welcome in a, in a kind of distilled group, you might say, within one kind of, you know, organized military companies. Certainly there's lots of evidence of Irish Americans that served within other militia companies. But this whole idea of one that's entirely Irish was, was something that was, you know, troublesome to a lot of Americans in the time period, despite when we think about that today. Uh, and the same thing is true with the 54th, right? This is a new idea to some extent. There is certainly evidence, and Matt, I'm sure you can talk about this in a lot more detail than me, uh, during the American Revolution and Black regiments that fought or Black men that, that served during the Revolution um, and, and were very successful, were excellent soldiers, and helped us to win our independence in that way. So this story is not something that's really new to the Civil War, but it does seem like it is much more of a watershed moment um, in terms of the ability of free Blacks in America to be able to actually serve on behalf of their country. Um, so I just wanted to bring up the story. I'm not sure, Matt, if you want to contribute anything about what you've seen with, with earlier time periods with, with service of, of African-Americans here in the United States. Yeah, yeah, I could comment a bit on that, because I think what's, you know, what is interesting is, you know, not unlike the Montgomery Guards being solely composed uh, of Irishmen. Um, and there's actually, you know, there's concern, again, some of the, the press responses to the Montgomery Guards incident in 1837 is that, you know, this will cause, this will, or this will prevent the assimilation of Irish into American society, rather than them becoming, you know, a further confined to their own culture, their own society, and not becoming part of broader American society. Um, what's interesting though, with, with the experience of you know, men of color, men of African descent, um, is that the, the 54th and the experience in the Civil War 
actually stands in, in really sharp contrast in some ways to the American Revolution or even the War of 1812 to a certain extent, where the exigencies of war, even though these men you know, typically were specifically excluded from militia obligations in their various colonies and provinces and, and then later states that they came from, the, the need for manpower during wartime often trumps societal norms. Um, and so even going back to the French and Indian War, there is, a, there is a precedent that you get who you can get, especially if it's men who aren't going to disrupt the social fabric. Uh, of society, you know, don't take off your productive white male workers if you can get some poor white guy or you know some soldier of man of color to, to take his place. Um, and we see it in the French and Indian War. We see it again in the Revolution. And Congress, actually, at the beginning of the Revolutionary War, says like explicitly, you know, no Africans. Um, and then later they rescind that because they realize they need manpower so much. And the interesting experience of the Continental Army is, although it's not policy. For much of the time when you see men of color serving, and there are times in the war when they amount to 10% of certain continental regiments or the army at large. And that's, you know, that's a huge number um, comparatively considering all the rest of the armies of the kind of, you know, the Northern Atlantic world at the very least. And so they end up serving side by side with, you know, white soldiers, you know, with Irishmen, with Scots, with Americans of various stripes. Um, in a kind of de facto integration. Now, that doesn't mean that that's perfect. It doesn't mean that the officers or the other soldiers, you know, respect them as equals necessarily. Um, and I have plenty of examples. Here at Ticonderoga in 1777, men of color are literally plucked out from various regiments in the Continental Army and pulled together as a kind of a pioneer corps, a, a labor force to do constant work because you know, that fits with, with some of the kind of social norms of the Anglo-American world at this point. The same thing happens by the War of 1812. Um, you know, even after the revolution, the US Army, you know, Henry Knox issues explicit orders as Secretary of War for recruiting for the tiny US Army of the, the late 18th century. No black men, no Indians. It is supposed to be white men only. Um, and yet by the War of 1812, you need men and especially in New England, you see a lot of men of color serving. Um, and this is, you know, this is shocking to some of the officers of now the U new nation, you know, who up here in uh, Lake Champlain, 1814, the commander of the army is a South Carolinian. And he's seeing men of color, you know, sprinkled out throughout the regiments. He does the same thing. He pulls them off and he, he makes them into Pioneer Corps, effectively. So they're not shouldering muskets. Um, and that's why the experience of you know, the 54th Massachusetts and then later the U.S. colored troops, you know, is so remarkable is that these are whole bodies of men that aren't just doing the work. And, and that itself, you know, th there is a there's an arc to that in the revolution that even early on, they are thought about as a labor corps, um, but, you know, prove their mettle in action and their ability to hold up under fire uh, as, as well as any other troops in the world. I think the one thing that I find interesting over this, you know, late 18th into the early 19th century phase, and it happens kind of I think broadly during the wars with revolutionary France and Napoleon is that race becomes increasingly a category that is, that is understood and soldiers of color are pulled off to serve as bodies of troops only composed of soldiers of color rather than being integrated um, you know, even on a de facto level as the Continental Army was. Um, and I can find examples from the 18th century of you know, random individual men of color serving in European military units. But the idea that they will be pulled off, you know, kind of reinforces race as a, as a structural category in these societies with, you know, deeply pernicious effects, even if these men are able to show their ability to behave as well as anyone else on the battlefield and in society. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Matt. Okay, well, I think that probably the best thing to do is to actually start thinking a little bit more how we can tie this back to our exhibits here. Again, we're really excited with our exhibit that we have here at the museum through next July of, of 2023. Um, so I want to talk about a couple of things that we have going on with that exhibit that tie directly into what we've been talking about here tonight. Um, so one of the new items I was talking about that's actually coming to the exhibit this summer, which we are very, very excited about, uh, is this bass drum here. So this bass drum initially made in 1817 by Abner Stevens, who had literally a contract making bass drums for the Massachusetts militia in the early 19th century. Um, after the Civil War, this drum was repurposed and used by 
the first all black fife and drum corps in Connecticut. Um, it's, they were called the Wallington, Wallerford, Wallingford, excuse me, Dreadnoughts. Um, and they were actually formed by a former member of the 54th Massachusetts. So William hmm. Tony Smith, um, which you can actually see him right here in the center, um, was actually the founder of the unit. Um, he was wounded at the Battle of Fort Wagner, like so many others um, during the, the Civil War. Uh, and they basically formed this unit that they had these really, you can see in the images, these really great uniforms that were actually green in some of the period accounts. Um, and they really were movers and shakers in kind of the, the whole fife and drum movement after the Civil War. Um, in fact, by the 1880s, he's having entirely, you know, all black fife and drum corps muster. So this whole thing, I mean, nowadays, many people live around here in New England, we know that we still have these fife and drum musters in various parts throughout New England, in various parts of the year. And if it wasn't for Tony Smith, it's arguable that a lot of those things wouldn't be happening. I and mean, he really was um, really quintessential to that whole fife and drum movement after the Civil War. Now, fife and drum music was very, very popular far before the Civil War. I mean, literally you see military bands that are touring up and down the East Coast during the village period. Um, and it continues to be very popular after the war. So we will be putting this on display, hopefully by the end of this summer, we're actually building a special case for right now because we thought it was a snare drum when it was offered to us uh, on loan by Doug Quigley, who's a, a local um, Sturbridge inhabitant and former OSV uh, employee and uh, current member at the museum who plays in our fife and drum corps at the museum. So we're very excited to have this. We're, we're trying to make a good home for it in the gallery that will be really front and center. Um, and thank you also to the Wallingford Historical Society that's given us this high quality scan of a couple of members of the Wallingford Dreadnoughts. Um, it's just a really great story um, to be tying into our exhibit and thinking about the post-Civil War world. So along with that, uh, I've been bending Matt's ear constantly, pretty much, for the last year or so. Uh, we've been talking for a while about wanting to actually reproduce the uniform of the Montgomery Guards. Um, now, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of problems with making reproduction clothing in general from the 19th century. Very often we'll find that the materials that are available to us today are just not even close to the type of materials that would have been available in the early 19th century, the quality which is far superior, which is a whole other conversation about the way the textile industry has evolved today. Um, but we decided that we want to take on this project and do the best we could to have recreations of the Montgomery Guards uniforms for two reasons. So we wanted to have one that would go into our armed and equipped exhibit about the militia to talk about the history of the Montgomery Guards and this whole idea of ethnic militia companies that are starting to emerge in the, in the mid 19th century. Um, and also we wanted to be able to use this in interactive programming with the public. So we had two uniforms that were actually made um, I went up to Fort Ticonderoga, spent some time with Matt along with a friend of ours who's a tailor, Adam Hodges LeClaire who actually made the coats. And we spent hours just getting measurements off the coats, looking at how they were put together. And then from there started the whole process of how we're gonna be replicating these things. So one of the coats is currently actually on display and armed and equipped. Um, you can see from the image here, we actually even reproduced the buttons. So curiously, even though they spent the money to have a custom die made for their cap plates, the buttons that are actually on the coat are just kind of run of the mill militia artillery buttons from the late 1820s, early 1830s. Um, I mean, it's possible they could have been changed out, but you see it very typically actually with militia uniforms that regardless of their branch of service, they would kind of go for whatever button looked really cool, was really shiny, had patriotic emblems on it. Uh, and so it's not really unheard of, even with all the other Irish iconography that we see on this uniform to see a more run of the mill button that's included. But we did actually send out a button from the OSV collection that was donated right at the beginning of this project um, and had pewter copies made that were then gold plated to match the original ones, which initially would have been stamped in brass um, but the stamping process is, is something that's very hard to replicate today. Um, so Matt had also showed some images of the cap earlier, which you saw was a very, very elaborate piece. Um, the cap plate itself um, was, was certainly the most hardest part of this, this project to really crack. And honestly, in all the years Matt and I have been talking about this, that was the one thing we're like, yeah, we can make the rest of this, but how could we ever do that cap plate? Uh, because the caps themselves are, are actually relatively simple construction, but the cap plate being struck with a custom die we thought made it very unattainable. So what we actually did was a lot of, uh, of collaboration with a couple of different tech companies to figure out what the best way was to actually recreate the cap plate. Um, initially, 
staff from Fort Ticonderoga actually took the cap out to have it photographed. And the hope was that through photogrammetry, we could actually create a 3D model with basically a point cloud that could be used for, for creating a 3D model that could then be 3D printed. Unfortunately, because the cap plates are so shiny, it actually made it very difficult to get a really detailed scan. So we instead worked with um, a firm that does a lot of online exhibitions and 3D design and literally had a designer painstakingly de create all of the details of a 3D model of the cap plate. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth between he and I, and eventually we ended up coming out with a 3D model, which is still in process right now. So this is a little bit of a, of a cliffhanger for those of you who are on here today. Um, we're hoping to have the caps completed by the end of, this, of, of, of August and actually have these uniforms fully on display as part of our militia muster on September 3rd to really bring this story to life. Um, but for right now, that's still a little bit in the dark. So I'll, I'll keep you guessing a little bit about that part but it has been quite a process replicating this. Um, and again, we're so grateful to, to Matt and the others at Forte Condoroga who have made this possible. So with that, I think we're gonna move on to any questions that, that any folks have. Awesome, thank you both so much for that great conversation. Um, we have a few comments and questions from our viewers. So Tom Keller has a great comment. He says, absolutely fascinating, but not surprising that even antebellum New England states excluded men of color from the militia, but cosmopolitan New Orleans, Louisiana, later part of the Confederacy, accepts men of color in the militia. Just goes to show that nothing is ever simple. <laughs> true, <laughs> yeah. True. Eric, uh, can I ask you a question real quick? Sure, um, sure. Because in, in searching around for, you know, the kind of inclusion of, of individuals like this, you know, minority populations, you know, of whatever color, um, you know, the question always comes up about before the Civil War, you know, are men of color in the militia? And I've seen scattered references in places like New York City to kind of semi-military groups like the Hannibal Guards that, you know, I don't think are legally militias in the in the true sense of, of the volunteer companies that we're talking about. Have you seen more about that? I, I haven't seen any evidence yet, and it's something that I definitely want to try and try and find more information about. Um, yeah. I mean, of course, service in the militia, and even like you're saying, you know, this whole idea of race in the, in the early 19th century becomes so much more of a, a differentiator in the social construct. And, and of course, you know, what is considered to be black in the 19th century, as far as the government is concerned, is really, you know, what's considered to be kind of passing, I guess we'd call it today. So there certainly could have been individuals who were of African descent, who, uh, descent or were of indigenous descent that served in the militia. Um, but the way the law is written, it seems like it's it's really hard to find evidence of that. And, and of course, you know, in, in other in other period documentation, for instance, if you look through the, the directories of people lived in the city of Boston, for instance, which again, different from, from rural New England, but you can clearly see that people of color are differentiated and separated out in terms of the population. If we were to see a, a muster roll or all sorts of other things like that, you wouldn't necessarily expect to see that kind of information listed. So I would love to try to find some evidence of it. But what I've been able to dig up so far, at least in terms of, of, you know, peacetime militia has not really produced anything. Like you said earlier, there's certainly plenty of examples of, you know, a time of war. There's the need for the service. And again, they're trying to take whoever they can. And there's the opportunity for people of color and indigenous people to serve in, in a way that they, they can really, you know, help to, to contribute to the effort. But again, as soon as those conflicts end, it seems like they were just like, no, we're, we're done with this now. This, this was a bad idea almost. Um, yeah. So I would love to find more. It's, it's definitely something that's on my research agenda of continuing yeah. to try to find more stories like this, but um, yeah. Awesome. Um, we have one question from Stefan. Can you speak to the Black officers in the 54th or were there Black officers in the 54th Massachusetts Regiment? Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, all of the officers were white in the 54th. That might have been different with some of the U.S. Colored Troops regiments, but I, I, I'm not an expert to be, um, to be making a lot of, of claims on that during the Civil War period. I'm not sure, if, Matt, if you have any idea. Yeah, I, if I recall correctly, they do commission Black men as officers, but it's late in the Civil War. Um, it, it takes time. It's not, you know, not with the initial raising. Um, and they're never, to my knowledge, again, this is a little past my area of expertise, but they're certainly not at the level of, you know, regimental command. They're not majors, lieutenant colonels, colonels, or even maybe captains, but, you know, lieutenants, um, you know, kind of company officers. 
Um, I know there are a, a few at least, but I, I don't know all the all the details of that. Awesome. That was it for our questions. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to share in the Q&A. Was there anything else you guys wanted to discuss before we sign off? You know, I just, again, I want to thank you, Matt, for your time. This has been a great conversation. I mean, you and I talk about this kind of stuff all the time, but it was great to do it in a way the public can benefit from all these amazing conversations that we always have about um, the militia and, and military service in the 19th century. So thank you so much. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. And, and you know, I think, uh, you know, we, as obviously we talk about this a lot, but, you know, the idea of the militia as, like, as an institution is something that is so alien to us today, you know, in part because not long after we're talking about, you know, in Massachusetts, especially, especially, you know, the expectation that a broad part of the population will participate in this in any way, you know, goes away legally. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that the militias of the early 19th century are imperfect organizations, that they do not truly represent in a real numeric way, the people, you know, it's the people in arms, but eh, is it really, you know, it, it is an absolute minority of the population when you get to the fact that women are excluded, uh, people of color are, exclu are excluded, various other exemptions from, you know, postal workers to merchant seamen. I remember one Massachusetts law I looked at from the early 19th century uh, that, uh, that got me out of the militia because I have a master's degree. Um, you know, which is, which is kind of shocking. And yet still some of the figures I've seen, at least for the, you know, first couple of decades of the 19th century is that maybe 10% of the population is involved in the militia, which is a staggering figure for engagement with a military institution. When you consider that today, it's like less than a 1% of our population that is involved with any branch of the US armed forces. And that includes reserves and national guard. Um, so, you know, it's one of these institutions like a lot of early American history that, you know, there, there are different sides to it and you can understand it differently and, and what it represents uh, in these societies. It, it is in some ways this path to citizenship and becoming and being a part of a republic, you know, which requires its citizens to be engaged. And yet at the same time, it's exclusionary, uh, it's, it's, you know, hived off, it doesn't allow people to do it. And, you know, in that sense, it is, it is such a remarkable and kind of, you know, true representation of the, the early American state. So thanks for letting me talk about it with you. Oh, well, thanks for being here. Awesome. All right. So we're going to sign off. If you did not catch the entire program or you would like to share it, a recording of the webinar will be sent to our members in the following week, and it will also be uploaded to the Old Sturbridge Village YouTube page. For those of you who enjoyed this program and are interested in more, our next webinar, Clothing the Family, a museum-wide effort, will be on August 25th at 6 p.m. And you can find more information and register for this webinar on the OSB website. And I also shared a link in the chat as well. And once again, a huge thank you to Dr. Matt Cagle and to Derek Heidemann for sharing their knowledge with us. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Hope you have a great evening. Thank you.